All right. It looks like we are finally live. QuickBooks is committed to helping small businesses succeed, no matter what comes their way. We put together this live Q&A to help connect small businesses like yours with experts to help you answer questions about running a business in today's crazy times. Hi, I'm Hector Garcia. I'm a CPA and I wanna thank you for joining us. I'm an accountant and I have been a small business owner for about 12 years. Our firm is based out of Miami, Florida. We have up to eight employees, but we serve clients all over the world, really. Uh, we have embraced remote work early on, working with people remotely, with virtual meetings, and we've also embraced uh, cloud-based tools, such as QuickBooks and other integrated apps. My specialty is giving my clients advice, advice on cash flow management, process improvement, inventory management, or implementing cloud-based accounting systems. We sent a poll early on before we started the live Q&A to ask you what topics would be most interesting for you to for me to discuss today and what kind of questions I should be answering. Uh, we had the top two were bookkeeping best practices in today's time, and second, how to deal and track with SBA and PPP-based loans. Now, we're gonna have in the future another Q&A session or webinar specifically to talk about PPP. Uh, there are just so many uh, things out there that we need to wait for uh, the government to give us clarity on before we can do a live session like this. So we're gonna be focusing on the first topic, the one you told us you wanted to ask the most questions about, which is bookkeeping and accounting best practices. Uh, if you're interested in additional resources, please check out the link below. And if you wanna see more live Q and A's like this in the future, make sure to like and subscribe so you get notified. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Let's see uh, what questions we have coming in. All right, we have a question from Darla. Do you have to have, do you have any bookkeeping tips uh, for a business trying to move online? So Darla, great question. So when you ask businesses trying to move online, there really are sort of two parts of the question. One is to move your operations online, which means you are doing more online sales or you're operating more in an online environment and less of a brick and mortar environment. So I'm gonna answer that one. And then second is for people that wanna uh, do the accounting on the cloud itself. They wanna ditch Excel or some other accounting systems that are based on a desktop or have you stuck in a physical computer for you to work in. So let me start with the first uh, part of the question, which is bookkeeping and accounting tips for people that wanna move their business online. So first of all, let's make the assumption that you are now uh, moving to sell more products and services on the cloud. Now you may use different platforms. Uh, Shopify, it's the, probably the world's most popular e-commerce platform. So if you are gonna be selling products, I would probably say Shopify is one of those tools that makes it really, really easy for you to post your products and sell them up there. Now, if you're gonna sell professional services online, you're gonna need multiple tools. Uh, some tools like, uh, like Zoom and other teleconference tools are gonna be crucial for you to be having those conversations with your clients online. Also, you can use tools that do automated uh, calendar setting, tools like Calendly and other calendar settings that actually integrate with your email. So when someone says, hey, are you available this Friday at two o'clock for a consultation or for a meeting or whatever that professional service happens to be, instead of you stopping everything you're doing, taking a look at your calendar and coming back and saying, okay, I have availability at this time, you would basically synchronize your email and calendar with this calendar tool and allow your customers to pick a time uh, in there directly. So we're talking about potentially moving to selling more products online or selling more services online. In addition to that, you can use uh, tools like QuickBooks Online, which you can integrate with some of these tools to be able to automate the bookkeeping data flow. That way you don't have to re-enter the customer's name and address, for example, that you got in the calendar software or in the Shopify product e-commerce software into QuickBooks again. So you wanna look at the tools that have been approved to integrate with QuickBooks to simplify the bookkeeping process. And you can go to apps.com, A-P-P-S.com to see what applications have been approved to talk directly with QuickBooks Online. So Darla, I would probably say those are the high level tips I can think of right at the moment. 
Okay, next question. I got a question from Jacob. I'm trying to get my uncle to let me do the bookkeeping for a restaurant. What are the perks of bookkeeping? Well, <laughs> so Jacob, um, you know, long hours of uh, data entry and stuff is technically not a perk. Uh, if you are going to be translating uh, physical documents like like Z outs, the, the daily receipt from your POS system, or if you're gonna handwrite things in a, in a general ledger or have this crazy spreadsheet where you have a daily log of every sale that you have, that it, it won't feel like a perk, I would say, per se. So I would say one of the perks would be working with an automated digital system that can you know, maybe export that information into uh, whatever accounting and bookkeeping system you want to use. Now, if you're able to get rid of data entry time and integrate the data from your re your uncle's restaurant point of sale system into QuickBooks, then some of the perks could be the advice that you can give them. So before your uncle or yourself would spend maybe three to four hours a day doing data entry in your accounting system, now if you can effectively reduce that to to an hour or 30 minutes per day, you can focus on analyzing the numbers, right? What products are we selling the most? What products are we selling the least? At what times is the restaurants uh, more busy than others? Right now, it's a really slow time for restaurants. So it's a very difficult thing to do right now to do any sort of sales analysis, but it's also a perfect time to prepare, right? So prepare those metrics. What are those things that you want to measure? Do you want to measure things like average ticket per table, average ticket per person, uh, dessert attachment rate, right? How much wine and beer are you selling on top of the food? And then if you're starting to see trends where a certain product type is actually going down or, or going up, you can offer uh, specials and try to uh, level out or boost a specific segment of the business. Uh, something else that's worth doing as a bookkeeper kind of beyond the accounting numbers is to see if you can collect where are the customers coming from. So if these customers are coming with coupons or if the servers are proactively asking, hey, where did you hear about us? And they say, uh, Yelp, Google, my friend recommended it. It would be nice to have a tally of that. It's a little bit beyond the bookkeeping numbers, but if you have a tally of where the business is coming from, you can start marrying the bookkeeping uh, information such as you know sales, costs, labor, all that stuff with how effective is our marketing uh, being in reaching out new audiences and bringing in new patrons? So uh, Jacob, the perks are uh, your proximity to the numbers and your ability to start drawing relationships between the end result of the bookkeeping and the things that are outside of bookkeeping that you get to observe. And many times is the, is the combination of those two informations that provide the greatest insight. So the business owner can make timely decisions and quite frankly, uh, life-changing decisions that can evolve that business into the next level. So bookkeeping is the, the most basic of the tools that we need to have the primary set of information about money, right? Where, where's the money coming in? Where's the money com coming out uh, to? What are we spending money in? So we can first be conscious about how we're managing cash, and then we can make a decision in terms of how we're gonna use the profits to reinvest back into the business? Should we reinvest in marketing? Should we expand the restaurant? Should we have bigger tables, smaller tables? So that's really the perk, Jacob. So if you get into bookkeeping, if you get into accounting because you start doing your uncle's books, I would obviously learn the fundamentals of bookkeeping and accounting, get the numbers right, but also start gathering some, uh, some intelligence about what's happening beyond the numbers so you can give your uncle advice and take the restaurant to the next level. So Jacob, um, hopefully that uh, that was an uh, answer to your question. All right, what else we have? Uh, Nicole, Nicole's asking, how do I pay myself uh, as a business owner inside QuickBooks? Okay, so, so that's got a multiple prong question. And if you follow uh, my content before, you know I don't give straight answers, I give kind of elongated answers. So Nicole, your question is, I'm a business owner, how do I pay myself? And the second part is, how do I record that into QuickBooks? So let's first start with your entity structure. If your business is a C corporation or an S corporation, and if you don't know, just ask your accountant, your lawyer, or look at your tax return and see if you can figure out which, which one it is. Um, if you are a C corporation, S corporation, you must pay yourself 
through payroll. So as a business owner, you have to have some sort of reasonable payroll. Now you can pay yourself a dividend or a distribution uh, past the reasonable payroll. So you can, as a business owner, you can have the perk of both being an employee and also being the owner of the business that can reap some of the benefits to a distribution or a dividend. So you have to identify which is payroll and which is a distribution or a dividend. It's easy to identify Payroll is going to have tax withholding, and you're probably going to use a payroll system such as QuickBooks or ADP or Paychex or any of the major uh, payroll companies. So as long as your checks are paychecks with taxes on it, that's essentially a paycheck. So that portion would go into QuickBooks in your payroll expenses category, just like all your other employees. Now, let's say for the other part, the dividends or the distributions that are beyond payroll, that is going to go in the equity section. So you're going to go in your balance sheet and there should be an account in your equity section called shareholder distribution, or it could be called owner draw. And in partnerships, sometimes they're called uh, partners capital or partners draw. In a C corp, it's called a dividend. So as long as it's an account that you understand for it to be your distribution, your dividend, your draw, doesn't matter what name you use, and it's inside the equity section, you will be fine. Now, in the case that you're not an S-Corp uh, or a C-Corp, that you're maybe a partnership, a sole proprietor, or an LLC, you're actually not required that, uh, that if you have a partnership or a sole proprietor, you're not required to be on payroll yourself as the owner, and then you will only be taking uh, distributions or draw. So you will only be putting that money in the equity section, whatever the account that you choose to use. So uh, Nicole, hopefully that answered your question. All right, let's see what, what else we have. Uh, Carrie says, can you explain how to reconcile? Okay, a, a very loaded question. So let's start with the concept of a bank reconciliation. This is probably one of the things that makes most small business owners intimidated when they start using an accounting or a bookkeeping system. So let's start with the concept of what reconciliation is. So in an accounting system, you are going to uh, enter transactions, invoices, payments, bills to vendors, uh, deposits, checks, credit card charges. You're going to be entering a whole bunch of transactions in your accounting system. This is prior from you looking or verifying your bank. Then at the end of the month or the end of the week even, you're going to pull up all your bank and credit card statements. You can print them and physically have them in front of you, or you can have them in a second screen in your monitor. And then you're going to go into a reconcile function inside QuickBooks, where you're going to verify that every single transaction that you uh, entered in QuickBooks, whether it's a payment to a vendor or a, a payment from a customer, matches what came into the bank. And you're going to put a check mark. You're literally going to put a check mark on your paper and in QuickBooks transaction by transaction to make sure they check out one to one. At the end of the reconciliation, there's going to be a zero balance of the differences between what's in QuickBooks and what's in the bank. And there might be some additional transactions that will probably be spelling some sort of bookkeeping error or a timing issue. So when you reconcile, let's say the month of May and every single transaction matches a bank with the exception of maybe three checks, it probably means that those three checks have not cleared the bank yet. So you did spend them, you did issue them. So they're rightfully in your accounting system, but they won't show up on that month's uh, reconciliation. They will probably show up on the next month's reconciliation. So the purpose behind reconciling is to verify and help you Make sure you, that you don't have duplicate transactions or that you don't have erroneous transactions. Now, in some businesses where you have cash expenditures and cash deposits, right, or let's just not call it deposits, where you receive cash and it doesn't go through the bank or you pay cash without using a debit card or a check or a credit card, there's not going to be an actual statement to reconcile against. So for that, you're going to reconcile against receipts. So you're going to have all the physical receipts and you want to make sure that every physical receipt you have for money coming in or money coming out matches what's in QuickBooks. And that would probably be more of a manual reconciliation. So, uh, Carrie, when it comes to reconciling, that's probably what you mean is to match up your bank and your credit card to just to help you increase the level of accuracy. So, Carrie, I hope that that answers your question. All right. What else we have here? Okay, we have a question from Addy. 
how can I organize bookkeeping tasks to not get overwhelmed at the end of the year? Great question, Addy. So first of all, if you, even if you have all the receipts and you put them in a box and you uh, staple them to a folder and you have a folder for each month and then you go to your accountant with all the paperwork and have them do the accounting, for you, it wasn't overwhelming, but for the accountant it is because you still have to do hundreds of thousands of transactions in a short period of time when it comes to doing tax returns. So my recommendation is not to wait till the end of the year uh, or, or after the fact to do the bookkeeping. My recommendation is to do bookkeeping at least in a monthly basis. You can use tools like QuickBooks, or you know any other accounting system where you're recording transactions in real time. Now, Adi, I would say the number one tool to help you uh, not get overwhelmed is to do something called bank feeds, which means you connect QuickBooks to your bank and your credit cards, and you allow QuickBooks to download the transactions on a daily basis. And then on a daily basis, you're gonna see them in your accounting system, and you're able to categorize and reconcile each one of them. So if somehow you can find five to 10 minutes a day every morning to reconcile all of yesterday's transactions, that's going to reduce the amount of overwhelm. The other part that's really overwhelming is trying to remember, right? So if you do a transaction yesterday, right, you spent the money yesterday and you look at it in your bank today, you are most likely to remember that's something that you spent a year ago. So part of the overwhelm when it comes to waiting a year to the year accounting is to go back and backtrack, pull up check images, pull up uh, customer receipts, you know, go into the archive, go into the box, maybe look at a receipt that's starting to fade and makes it a lot more difficult to remember. So remember, bookkeeping, it's a combination between uh, the receipts, what happened through the bank, and your memory, because you have to use a little bit of, of uh, human um, uh, uh, intuition, right? You have to use your own determination, your own understanding of the transaction to then be able to determine the nature of the transaction so you can categorize it correctly. So if you wait too long to categorize it, it's probably going to be much tougher uh, to categorize. So that's that would be my recommendation, to handle your books on a daily basis. So Adi, hope that answers your question. Uh, let's see. Oh, great question. So we have another question from Ruben that says, "How you can you explain how to use petty cash? Okay, so let's start with the concept that petty cash is not a category in your accounting. It's not a type of expense. Petty, think of petty cash as uh, an accounting system for money in your pocket or money in an envelope or money in a safe, right? So it's basically any cash coming in or coming out of your accounting system that does not run through a bank. So when you take out cash to spend it in your business because you want to spend it in cash, you're usually going to go to the bank and take a withdrawal. So you're going to take a $200 cash withdrawal, let's say, or you're going to write a check to cash and you're going to go to the bank and you're going to cash out the money. Basically, you're going to deposit $200 into your petty cash bank account. It's not a real bank account, but in accounting, it's a bank account. So you deposit $200 into the petty cash bank account, and now you're going to keep a register of all the expenditures. So you bought some pizza for the team. You spend $50 in Pizza Hut. So you're going to record in your petty cash register uh, $200 initial deposit minus $50 of the Pizza Hut expenditure. And you're going to keep that receipt in a petty cash folder or scan it. Um, so we have an actual record of how we spend the money. Remember that when you're spending, uh, you're making business expenditures through a credit card or a bank, you're going to have a permanent record of that just by pulling up the bank statements. But with petty cash, you're not. So you're going to count in those receipts to do that. At the end of the day, that petty cash account should be zero or close to zero because you really don't want to have that much cash laying around. I understand some businesses always have $1,000 in cash just in case so they can make last minute expenditures. And that's okay. And you just, you just want to make sure that that account in your accounting system also, I mean, or always, um, uh, you know, ends up at whatever that dollar amount is. So just treat uh, petty cash just like a regular uh, bank account. Now, we're getting a lot of questions about the Paycheck Protection Program, about the SBA loans. And the reason why we're not addressing them is because this is a live feed from QuickBooks. And there's a lot of legal matters that go around answering questions that have legal or tax uh, repercussions. And 
Treasury has not yet issued uh, clear guidelines on how loan forgiveness goes, which is the bulk of the questions that we're getting regarding PPP loan forgiveness. So I promise you that either via my YouTube channel or uh, in a QuickBooks uh, Live type of setting or a QuickBooks webinar, that there will be content around PPP once we get more clear information from Treasury and from the SBA. So that's why we're skipping some of the PPP questions. So I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, uh, I have a question from Vinny. How do you pay employees as an LLC? It's a good question. Vinny, uh, whether you're an LLC, a C Corp, an S Corp, or a sole prop, all employees must be paid the same way. You're gonna withhold their federal income taxes. You're gonna withhold what's called FICA, which is Social Security and Medicare. And you might withhold state uh, income taxes, assuming you are on that specific uh, on a specific state that charges income taxes. So some people choose to do this manually or through an Excel spreadsheet, but most small businesses just don't have the time to track uh, payroll expenditures and withholding manually. So they'll use a payroll system. You can either use a payroll system like uh, QuickBooks uh, Payroll inside QuickBooks Online. You can use QuickBooks Payroll for QuickBooks Desktop. Uh, you can use a uh, third-party payroll processor like ADP or Paychex. And many accounting firms offer the payroll service outsourcing as well. So as an LLC or any type of business, you're going to figure out what the rate of that employee is, whether it's a fixed salary or an hourly rate. You're going to multiply it times the number of hours in the period, and then you're going to reduce all those taxes. And then you're going to give the employee the net check, the balance of the check. At the end of the year, you're responsible for issuing what's called a W-2, which is a document that tells the IRS that you had an employee, who they were, how much money they got, and how much withholding you took out. And then they use a W-2 to do their uh, their own uh, their, their own taxes. Now, uh, a common uh, side question I get to how do I pay employees is what about subcontractors? So you can actually have subcontractors, uh, which are uh, not employees. These are individuals that are providing services as a third party. They're independent contractors to your business. They don't use your tools. You don't control their hours. They they have some uh, financial uh, risk of doing business with you uh, compared to an employee where it doesn't have much financial risk. And at that point, you can use them as a subcontractor and then you don't have to withhold taxes. You just write them a check. Just make sure you get a W-9. It's a form where they give you their information. So you can, at the end of the year, give them a 1099, which is a W-2 equivalent for independent contractors. So Vinny, hope that answered your question. Okay, let's see. We have a question uh, from Laura G. What do I ask a first-time client to provide me so I can start his bookkeeping? So Laura, I assume you're a bookkeeper, right? Or an accountant, and uh, or you're starting to get into the bookkeeping business and you're trying to figure out what is that first interaction look like with a small business owner so they can outsource the bookkeeping to you. So my, my first thing that I would ask is, I would find out up to what point their current bookkeeping is up to date. Is it last year? Is it la last month? I think that's a really important uh, thing because you need to know exactly at what point you're starting off. Then you're gonna ask them, at what point would you like me to take over your bookkeeping? Would it be January of this year? Will it be July of this year? That way you can start to patch up now, the financials that come from uh, previous work and the one that you will be doing. Most bookkeepers will start at the beginning of the year to make sure that they have a full tax year right. The next thing I would ask Laura is for bank statements and credit card statements, because that's going to be really useful. You're going to have the bulk of the accounting there. If they have a petty cash register or cash transactions or receipts, you want to ask for that. You want to ask the type of business that they're in and you want to have an understanding for the nature of the transactions because you need to know contextually based on the type of business so you can categorize the accounts correctly. Laura, I would also ask the bookkeep, the business owner what role you want uh, to play. Is the uh, business owner still going to do part of the work? Are they going to be creating invoices and then you'll be reconciling the payments? Will they, will they be making payments? Do they want to outsource the payments to you? So there's Tons of content specifically on that in my YouTube channel. So I welcome uh, you to check that out. But uh, but that would be the, the first couple of questions I would ask. So Laura, I hope that answers your question. 
Okay, we have a question from Emily. We are a greenhouse construction company and we have multiple jobs at once. How do I code transactions for each job so we can uh, track the money we spend per job? So if you're using QuickBooks Online and you're using QuickBooks Online Plus or Advanced, you can turn on the projects feature. If you're using QuickBooks Desktop, all versions of QuickBooks Desktop, Mac, PC, Pro, Premier, Enterprise, they do uh, job costing. Basically, once you turn on projects in QuickBooks Online or you're using job costing in QuickBooks Desktop, or I hope if you're using a different accounting system uh, that it has job costing. So you're gonna choose uh, next to each transaction, you're gonna choose the expense category and you're also gonna pick the actual job. Once you do that, when you're proactively choosing the job on every one of your expenditures, including payroll, uh, you'll be able to pull up a job profitability report that will tell you exactly how much uh, in expenses you spent on that job. And you could compare your income on the job versus the expenses and get a job profitability report. The idea, Emily, is you don't get too hung up on knowing how much money you make per job. It would be more about what did you learn about an unprofitable job. So if you can effectively uh, uh, figure out which jobs didn't make you money, you want to go back and reflect and say, what about that job made us lose money, right? Was it the sales process? Was there a lack of understanding of the client's uh, needs? Was it rework or redo that we could have prevented if we had better training or, or a better system in place? Did we not budget materials correctly? So the idea behind job costing is not so much to be engulfed in whether or not you're making money on the jobs, is are you learning to become better, more efficient and, effect and eventually more effective? So on the next job, you can be better at selling it and possibly say no if your customer is asking to pay too little for a job that is not possible to draw profit from. So uh, that would be my answer to your question, Emily. All right, we have a question from Miss Coniglio. In what instances should you make journal entries or try to reconcile your accounts? How do you delete journal entries? Okay, so we got a multiple uh, prong question. So generally speaking, if you're dealing with banks and credit cards and you're accounting through banks and credit cards, you really don't have to do journal entries. Right? Banks or credit cards all have natural transactions inside QuickBooks. There's going to be a check, an expense, a deposit. It all looks like a natural transaction and it won't require this debit and credit function. When you use journal entries, it's because you want to make one-time adjustments to the balances of any specific accounts. Uh, for example, let's say I'm going to prepay uh, a year's worth of insurance on July 1st. And let's say that's $10,000. So naturally, my $10,000 is paying half for this year and half for the next year. So you would record uh, the entire transaction into insurance expense because it's a natural uh, transaction, it's insurance expense. But then an accountant at the end of the year will recognize that you overpaid for insurance for this year, which will count for next year. So in order to have those expenses reflect the actual year that the expense was meant for, then we would do a journal entry. And that journal entry is meant to then reduce the insurance expense and move it onto the balance sheet into an account called prepaid expenses or prepaid insurances. And then we will use in the next year journal entry. So each month we take the $5,000 that are left, we divide it by six and we chop it up into six different payments so we can recognize and look at our financial statement where we can see the monthly insurance expense equivalent for that whole year's worth of insurance you prepaid. So that's an example of when you would use a journal entry. It's typically more of an accounting level thing. And for the most part is to make adjustments to avoid uh, overcounting or undercounting a particular category because there, maybe there are timing differences or it doesn't belong in the original category that it's in and you're temporarily adjusting it uh, to a different category until you can make it whole. Uh, so the other part of your question, Ms. Caniglio, is how do you reconcile accounts? And we talked about this earlier. We do bank reconciliations and credit card reconciliations with natural transactions. Uh, there's no need to look at journal entries when it comes to bank reconciliation. So hopefully that answers your question, Ms. Caniglio. Uh, let's see, we have a question from Kaylee. What kind of journal entry do I need to write, uh, to clear an old expense that was duplicated by mistake? So. Uh, what Kaylee's asking is, I closed my books last year. There's a check from, let's say, October of last year still hanging on my books. And for whatever reason, that check is a duplicate and uh, it was never cashed. 
So what kind of journal entry do I do to clean that out? So you're going to go back and look at the original transaction. There was a duplicate and a mistake. You're going to look at the category. So let's say, for example, the category was uh, office supplies. So you wrote a check for $100 for office supplies of a check that was never cleared. So what you're going to do is you're going to do a journal entry uh, against office supplies, and that's going to be a credit against office supplies, and then a debit against the bank. And the reason for that is when you go reconcile the next time, you're going to see the outstanding check that was never cleared. And then you're going to see an adjustment for this period reversing that transaction. So when you pick the old check and pick the new journal entry, it eventually zeroes out and it gets rid of that outstanding transaction. And the purpose of that is so we don't have to uh, keep that old check that will never be cleared in the books. And we recognize that that expense uh, wasn't should not have been recognized last year. Well, we, were, we already done the tax return, et cetera. So don't, we don't want to mess up previous years. So we're going to take and recognize the error this year by reversing that action. So uh, Kaylee, I hope that, that answers your question. Okay, we have our last question from Alisa. How would, how would a small business determine if they should move from a sole prop to an LLC or a single member to an S corp. Wow, that's a perfect ending question. So this is what we call tax planning 101 in my practice. Most small businesses, if they want to decomplicate themselves, if they if they want simplicity, they would simply just have a sole proprietor or a single member LLC, which is a sole proprietor. What I mean by decomplicating it means that you don't have to have a separate tax return. The business activities go inside of your tax return under a Schedule C. You don't have to have a, a formal corporation in the state. You don't have to pay that. You might still need to get a license depending on the activity that you're in, but you don't have to pay extra fees to have a formal corporation, or you don't have to have articles of incorporation and, and, and annual meeting minutes. So you can decomplicate your life by having simply a sole proprietor, single member LLC filing a Schedule C. However, in order to attempt to legally save money on taxes. What we uh, recommend is that as long as you're a US-based uh, person and you don't have more than 100 shareholders, that you convert your sole proprietorship to an S corporation. Now, if you're an LLC, it's an easy conversion. If you're a sole proprietor, all you have to do is go to your state and either form an LLC or form a corporation. And then we're gonna apply through the IRS using form 2553 we're going to formally apply to be treated as an S corporation. Now, a subchapter S corporation, what it does is the net income from the business is subject to income tax, but it's not subject to self-employment tax, which otherwise would be what a sole proprietor and a single member LLC would pay. Self-employment tax is 15.3%, which is tax in addition to your income tax. So as an S corporation, the profits of the business are not subject to self-employment tax. So you're gonna save you eventually up to 15% on your taxes. However, just one little tiny caveat, Alisa, if you convert to an S corporation, the owners of the business must have reasonable compensation. They must be on payroll. So you have to pay yourself a reasonable amount that you would otherwise pay another person to do the same job that you're doing. And as long as you're doing that, your payroll will be paying self-employment tax or we're paying social security and medicare through the payroll system but then the excess of that or the profits uh, will not be subject to self-employment tax so that's where the trick is there's there's a uh, big time tax savings for profitable businesses that convert to an s corp so so they can take the process their profits in excess of payroll as as a taxable income, but not subject to self-employment tax. So that portion is potentially a 15%, 15.3% uh, tax savings you can get on your return as a small business owner of an S corporation. All right, I think we're we're, uh, we're done. Uh, this was a 30 minute session. Thank you everybody for your questions. We got a lot more questions that we were able to answer. Uh, hopefully in the next type of live Q and A like this, other experts can help you answer some of those questions. Thank you very much for joining us today. So many great questions. Give this video a thumbs up if you want to see more live Q&A like this. Let us know in your comments what other topics may interest you. All the questions you didn't ask, uh, we're going to have the team of QuickBooks put it together so they know what type of live Q&A we should have in the future. If you're looking for more resources in the meantime, QuickBooks has compiled some helpful uh, tools, 
tips and other resources to help small businesses during this time. Make sure you check that out below. There's going to be a link to all those additional uh, tools. Uh, Intuit.me forward slash resource is the link. And also, uh, welcome to check out my own YouTube channel. Just look for my name, Hector Garcia, CPA. I have tons of content to help small businesses as well. Thank you very much, and we'll see you on the next one.